when you find yourself in the position of the mount, this is another way that you can think about finishing your partner that, again, is using your whole body to apply pressure to smaller parts of them, right? So Stefan here, when I'm on top of him, he's already looking to escape. And as he's doing that, one of the things that commonly is done is he'll start to turn to his side. Okay? So I'm going to go ahead and let him start turning to his side because what I want to do is I want to start have him expose the side of his back. Once he gets here, I'm going to take both hands onto his arm and I'm going to push it forward. When I push it forward, I'm going to drop my chest behind his shoulder blade. Once I've dropped my chest behind his shoulder blade, I have my other hand out here posted to help give me a little bit of strength to push into him. As I do this, I'm going to sneak my hand inside and open up his lapel. I'm going to continue to drive forward. The hand's going to sneak around underneath Stefan's head, and I'm going to turn the lapel towards my hand. The important thing is here, guys, I'm not just going for a straight grab. I'm actually going to turn the lapel towards him, towards my opposite hand, so that my thumb feeds in, and the fat part of the lapel rests on the palm of my hand. My fingers will curl behind the lapel. This makes for an infinitely tighter grip. Once I get here, I'm just looking to pull up my elbow in towards me a little bit, and then I'm going to start, start sneak, sneaking my body up, move my leg up. Don't leave your elbow hanging out, so you've got to pull it all in. And then from here, I'm going to grab onto his knee. If you can only grab the fabric, that's fine, but ideally, you want to be able to unhook the leg. From here, you can see my foot is posted on the ground. Stefan's slowly starting to turn pink. I'm going to roll him over, and then I'm going to sit my leg out and sit back. I'm not going to tap to a girl. <laughs> From here, I'm going to slowly pull my elbow in and finish. A lot of it's in the grip, guys. Everything else is great, but that small detail in the grip is going to make for a much tighter choke. From a different angle, if you were to do this, let's just look at the grip again. So I'm here, I want my partner to start escaping. I'm gonna let him move. So if you notice, I actually let him bounce me up and I followed his body movement so that I could actually get my knee off the ground and tuck my foot in. From here, grab onto the arm, drive it across and apply pressure onto the shoulder blade with your whole body. I'm posting my hand out so that I can continue to drive into him. From here, I'm gonna open up the lapel reach around and underneath, and again, turn the lapel towards my hand, insert the thumb, four fingers behind, so the fat part of the lapel is on the palm. From here, I'm going to sneak my body up, reach behind here for the knee, underhook it if I can, sit up, sit back, and wait for my partner to tap. This bow and arrow also works from the position of taking the back. If you have a failed sliding collar choke, you can also just turn into this one. It looks like this. So Stefan is here. I went in for my sliding collar choke, isn't really working. So what I want to think about here is again, taking the time to set up this grip. So open the lapel up, turn it in, drive your hand really deep. Then from here, if I can't finish this, I ripped my hand off, that's fine. I'm going to go ahead and use this momentum to pull his body towards my elbow, and I'm going to grab his knee as I come here. From here, I'm going to go ahead and sit my body up and finish. That change in grip makes such a difference. That's something I didn't know before. I, I'm kind of loath to share this technique because <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, it's a great little uh, detail. And again, this is something else that I learned very recently. Um, I've been using it for the last year or two, and I find that it's made my chokes 10 times more successful. Just out of interest, what do you say to the people who don't want to learn any lapel-based chokes? I always find it a bit funny because I'm, if you're defending yourself in a Speedo, you've probably done something <laughs> wrong getting into that in a self-defense context. You've probably done something wrong before that point. Yeah, well, I mean, the people that I often hear that argument from, I don't want to learn lapel chokes, uh, tend to be a lot of people that do MMA or submission grappling. Um, you can take that side and say, well, I only want to learn the types of submissions that you can do in both. But if you have it, why not make use of it, right? Most people walk around with shirts or coats or other things on their body. Why not take it and do something with it? I don't think that... Uh, learning something extra is going to be bad for you. 
I'm not sure if these people have another reason why they, they're choosing not to learn a lapel choke, but I certainly think they're very useful, especially, again, if you're a smaller person. Getting a piece of fabric between your neck is going to be much easier than me getting my arm or my leg somewhere, right? Mm. So it just makes for a much tighter submission. I think some of it, quite frankly, probably comes down to ego. People don't want to. They, they know what they know. And I, I'm all for concentrating and specializing on what you want to do. If you want to fight MMA, you should go no gi 90, 95% of the time, probably. There's arguments about that either way. But it, it when people get make the transition from no gi to gi, all of a sudden they start complaining about, oh, I was so wrapped up and so tangled up, and it's they're taken back to almost a beginner level again. Wouldn't it be better if that happens to you in a class context of occasionally, once a month, rolling with a gi and having one or two chokes that work with the gi as opposed to your first experience being having that jean jacket or that you know, windbreaker wrapped around your neck by somebody in a scrap. Yeah, and I think ultimately having use of the gi and knowing how to utilize it makes your game a lot tighter. I think no gi is essential as well. It makes you a little bit faster, more athletic, you know. Both things add to having a really complete game. So I see a lot of benefits to training gi chokes, gi jiu-jitsu, and a lot of benefits to training no gi submissions and no gi jiu-jitsu. Well, it's pretty hard to argue with Marcelo Garcia. Yeah, and you know, uh, maybe some people don't realize this, but a lot of his movements between no gi and gi are very similar. You know, some of the submissions are different, but for the most part, the movements and the transitions all translate really well between each other. So in class, when we're training, you know, either or, it's not a completely new game. And I think sometimes people relate no gi to something different from gi, right? And typically I've met a lot of people that go, oh, I don't, I don't like to train no gi, or oh, I hate putting the gi on. You know, it doesn't have to be like that. It's just a matter of how you're training your game. Can't we all just get along? <laughs> Can't we all just be like Marcelo Garcia? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I've distracted you long enough. Let's do this for, fa let's do this for real fast, and I'll uh, try and recover. Okay.